Good afternoon and welcome to FCI's webinar series. I'm Samira Salem, FCI's Director for Social Innovation and Community Development. We are very happy that you could join us for Dr. David Pate's talk entitled, A Discussion on Racial Inequity and Economic Insecurity Through a Black Male Lens. We want to express our gratitude to BMO Harris Bank for supporting this webinar series. And um, we do welcome uh, your questions and comments throughout the webinar. Simply type your questions or comments into the chat box on your screen and submit them to us throughout the webinar. In addition, we're recording this webinar and we'll make a link available afterwards so that you can share. We're very pleased to introduce our speaker, our speaker, Dr. David Pate, Associate Professor of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare. Welcome, Dr. Pate. Well, thank you. Again, good afternoon. Um, had to deal with those diff technical difficulties. Um, but right here, I'm going to talk to you about my research that I've done over the last 25 or so years looking at black men, particularly as it pertains to their um, racial in inequities as well as economic insecurities through a variety of reasons that have either been through um, personal decisions as well as through federal government decisions as well as through state policies. Um, I want to be able to, of course, acknowledge all of the people who have been very instrumental in my work uh, from UW, Madison, um, here who have done a lot of work with me from the School of Medicine and Public Health, UW-Milwaukee, who has given me a, a, a unanimous and wonderful support over the years, as well as federal government, Office of Family Assistance, as well as some personal colleagues at the Center for Family Policy and Practice, as well as Employee Milwaukee. I think because of them, I'm able to do the work I'm doing, and I'm very indebted to them um, as I move forward in my career. One of the things I wanted to start out with was looking at uh, something that ta Coast talks about in his, book, his article, The Case for Reparations in, Out of the Atlantic. And I think it serves as a good foundation as to what are some of the issues that have affected black people, particularly black men and women, um, in their historical presence in the United States. Um, and it's through four different phrases. One, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal practices, and 25 years of racist housing policy. Um, we'll talk. We'll touch on all of these a little bit um, because I do think they all have played a role in how people have been able to maintain or uh, or obtain agency as a as a citizen of the United States, but also in their ability to be able to have economic security over time. It's also important, I think, to start out this conversation with we're talking about how do we socially construct manhood, or how do we socially construct the occupation of being a father or being a man. Um, and two well-known researchers who I've come to know over the years talk about different periods and phases that have been really instrumental in looking at why men are who they are or how they play out their role um, as a father or as a man. Um, men have primarily taken on the role of breadwinner, as you see is the first point here. Um, and as you know, the breadwinner means that you're someone who takes the lead in the family. You tend to be the one who brings home, um, for lack of a better word, the bacon, or you bring home the main salary that kind of oversees the household. Um, and that's been the primary role that has maintained itself in how men view their role as a father or as a man. Um, they've also been seen as someone who is a sex role model once they have children and how children are, be able to, are able to decide who they are, what they should be, how they should act, how they should interact with other men or, other women, or, or with women or girls. Um, and more recently, we've seen this whole idea of the involved father, which came pretty much in the 70s where we started to acknowledge this feminine side of men, if you would say, as to how they can be involved with the child rearing and, and being involved and in being engaged in their children, particularly as it, when, as it became more well recognized and even pop culture like in a movie like Kramer versus Kramer uh, is when we started to see it play out in that way. Um, the periods of fatherhood though also play into that because one of the occupations as I've come to learn with a colleague at school in the paper that I recently wrote that being a father is an occupation and how you decide to play out that occupation has certain standards and one of those standards that you generally uh, uh, adhere to as a father is this role of breadwinner but in previous times historically the father has played the role of moral teacher um, for, for quite a period of time before the Industrial Revolution, the father was the one who did all the child rearing. He was the one who told the kids how to act and behave. He was the one that laid down much of the 
rules of the household, if you should say, in terms of how father, how parenting should be. It was after the Industrial Revolution that we saw a major change in the father's role and that this breadwinner role became, again, very prominent because of his ability to go outside the household. We went from being a very farming culture to now an industrialized culture. Um, where machinery was becoming taking over many of the rules that people were using um, at their own bodies for, and also it was sometime after slavery that people now had to were using more machinery because um, now the body was not the human resource, but now machinery was now going to be the resource of how to get things done. Fathers also again and became more the sex role model teacher of how do you act with a person in a household, and again nurturing. Uh, was another one of those roles that was played out as a father. So we saw some developmental changes, or we saw the social construction of maleness have some overlapping effects if you look at how it played itself out. And so, very, and it's still very much a complex, complex structural type of environment of, of a, a category that we're looking at. But the overlying thing about fatherhood or being a man is this whole thing of personal responsibility, which has played out very much in our government practices, but also as a United States citizen, we're really very big historically on this role of responsibility or personal responsibility, and what we expect you to do if you're going to adhere to the rules and practices of being an American citizen, which I think are important for this discussion in particular. So I'm going to start out with a quote from one of the men that I've interviewed, and I've interviewed over 500 men over the lifetime of my work as a researcher, and I primarily do qualitative research, which means that I do a lot of interviews uh, with people individually as well as focus groups to really ascertain how do people make a decision about um, their life and who they are. Um, and I'll start with this first quote of the man saying, I'm not trying to say men are innocent. But I mean, women get a lot more help than guys here. Guys tend to struggle a lot more, and really petty, pretty much the system just looks at you as either you're in a gang or you sell drugs or, the, or in that type of atmosphere. If you live on this side of town, which they're referring to as Milwaukee, you're pretty much, everyone over here does the same exact thing you know. The police is like they sweat you pretty much anything you know, and when I was growing up, I used to see that a lot. I've never done anything growing up. I mean, they have things for guys, but it's kind of limited because they look at you as a male. You should be able to provide for yourself, you know. And that's pretty much what I hear from a lot of the men that I interview, that there's a big sense of independence, which is what we really adhere to as an agency, a, 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 a variable or an attribute of being a man. Um, they pretty much want to be seen as responsible. Um, but also, as a culture, as a, as a government, we have very few opportunities that are available from a federal government perspective for men without children as well as women, but for men without children or men without their children in their custody, there's not very many things if you have a financial challenge that will allow you to be, be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, as they would say, or to be able to make a different make a difference in your ability to take care of yourself. And I think there's a variety of things that I think we'll talk about today that will have us challenge this whole idea and make us think about why that is. There's also been a number of pu publications over the years that I have read, or I'm sure some of you have read out there or, or are interested in knowing about. And one of the very first qualitative studies is the, is the book Tolly's Corner that looked at Negro street corner men, or men period, that had never been done before out by a professor at Howard University. Um, who, who talks about just what are, what is the, some of the challenges that black men were facing at that time in the 60s. Um, there's been a number of new publications um, that are out there, what we want to give our kids from the Center for Family Policy and Practice. There has been other publications. Of course, many of you must, I'm sure you're aware of the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, as well as the book Doing the Best I Can by Catherine Eden. All of them are looking at how are men involved in their children's life on a daily basis, but also how can we also look at certain policies or practices that could change to help these men be more engaged in their children's lives over time. So I would highly recommend if you are interested in reading or looking at more things, look at one of these um, historical documents as well as the more recent documents that are out to talk about some of the issues that men are facing currently. You know, one of the things that I've learned to do over time that I think has been really important is the whole idea of looking at a life course perspective. What are some of the things that really challenge all of us to be an adult? What are some of the things that allow us all to be able to adhere to what society expects of us? So I, I have to say over time, and some of the essential, essential elements that I've listed here are just what are some of the social age that you're in requires you to do and how do you identify with that? 
What are some of the things that are going on historically and a given time that's going to affect your ability to be an adult? What are some of the things that challenge you on a regular basis that um, you have no control over that really hinders you from your ability to fully act actualize in a way that will allow you to be an adult? So I have learned, based on my previous work, to take a more um, the fuller uh, look at what is a life course perspective of men versus a perspective that is just looking at one instance, one snapshot of their life. But what is, where do they, how do they start, and where do they, how do they get to this point in their life? And my, in in this discussion later on, we'll talk about current research I'm doing, which has done that, which looks at um, this particular thing called adverse childhood experiences of men men and how they are um, affected later in life and their ability to be able to do the things they need to do. One of the first things I also want to talk about is this whole idea of transition to adulthood. Um, when you leave home, what does that mean? If you complete school, what does that mean? Uh, but also the whole idea of entering the workforce, getting married, which is what uh, some of the researchers I've talked to have talked about is one of the kind of markers of being an adult, as well as having children. But of course, this varies by race, gender, ethnicity, social class, as to whether or not you are doing the things that are seen as markers of adult. And also, what are some of the things that hinder you from being a, an adult? Um, is important to me in, in my work in a very major way. Finally, I think it's important when we talk about this work around looking at men, that both parents need these things. One, they need a family sustaining employment, they need affordable housing, they need food security, they need access to health care, as well as reliable transportation and mental health services if necessary. And that's both adults. However, when we think about the word family, or we think about how families are constructed, we tend to think women and children. We don't think that both parents, that being the male parent, needs these services as well, which is something that I encounter and have encountered on a regular basis throughout all of my research, that we don't look at how do you look at each person individually in, in, in their ability to parent, but also in their ability to be an adult, and what is it that we do that either hinders, again, or helps this person to move forward. And one of the things I wanted to first start out with is education. Um, education is one of the markers or one of the things that we all are required to do. We're, we're required to be in school or we'll be seen as truant. However, there's been major studies over the last year that have identified particular things that are really distressing around the way black boys are looked at in school uh, and black students in particular. Um, black students are nearly four times as likely to be expelled from school um, than their white counterparts. Which is, a, which is a, another way of looking at when you look at a place that is supposed to be a nurturing, safe, um, encouraging environment, when certain students are looked at in a certain way that is going to be challenging to the um, teacher as well as to their place of uh, where they get most of their, where they're going to spend the most of their day, that doesn't allow for someone to fall in love with that environment. And a recent study uh, teachers were required, teachers were asked to look at um, a video that looked at white, black, Latino, and Asian children, and, they, and the teachers were supposed to identify what we would say is challenging behavior. And the children did not exhibit any challenging behavior in any of these videos, but is, according to this recent Yale study, the teachers identif identified all the black boys as being having the most challenging behavior in, those, in all of these videos, even though when you, if you observe these videos, um, and according to this particular researcher whom I talked to, there was nothing in the video that shows any instance of challenging behavior. And some of that may, some of you may be familiar with this term, but what he has attributed this to being is implicit bias, that you go in there thinking about what you think black kids are supposed to be like. You stereo, you have already in your mind a stereotype of what black kids are going to be like, particularly black males. And with that type of idea in your head, you're going to treat and teach kids in a way that's not going to be necessarily to their advantage. Um, and so... That's one of the more recent studies that came out of Yale from a professor, William Gillum, um, that's been, I thought was very interesting. And also recent research published by the American Psychological Association by Professor Goff demonstrates that black boys are also viewed as four and five years older than they are. So when you start, if you don't see them as, if you see them as having challenging behavior and then you view them as being older, 
that makes for a pretty messy experience in school for everybody, uh, particularly for those young black men who do, who may learn to hate school, may learn to not be wanting to be around those teachers, but also may not see this as a nurturing environment when this is a this is six at least sixteen years of their life, and they're finding some of this work um, out starting at preschool. So it, it's quite a long time, which and preschool for many of these young people can start at three. Uh, for depending on who their parents are and their parents' ability to have child care um, or to put their or to want to have their kids and what they're encouraged to do is to have early childhood development opportunities. So again, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to think about that you're starting out as a child, barely, you know, just now entering the world, being seen as someone who is having challenging behavior. And the, of course, that's going to affect your ability to be able to be uh, all you can be. Um, I think it's also important for this particular talk to look at four areas, wealth and assets, housing, employment, and health uh, for black men. There's going to be some overlap here for black women as well, um, but it's important for us to look at these and how have black men, uh, how are they affected, just based on my own research, but also based on what I've been able to read and, act and learn from other colleagues um, and, 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 and what has happened to this particular group of people. If you look at this slide right here, you can see that there's a significant amount of wealth gap between whites and blacks and Latinos um, for this particular slide out of the Pew Research Center. Whites' net worth is 13 times greater than blacks um, as we've looked from 1983 to now, um, which is significant. And when I mean net, net worth, I'm not talking about how much income you're bringing home, but do you own a home? Do you have stocks and bonds? Do you have other assets that are, in case of an emergency, you can lean on if you don't have your income that's going to be coming in on a regular basis? Um, for Latinos, it's just as bad in that they also have uh, the net worth of whites there is 10 times greater. Now, both all groups here, white, black, Hispanic, all lost money during the recession. So I'm not saying that no, not everyone came out of the recession looking great. But despite, even, even with the recession, blacks and Hispanics and whites, there still was a significant amount of wealth gap um, that does not allow for those days when you may have a serious doctor bill or someone's about to get a divorce or someone needs to get out of jail or someone needs to get the car fixed. Um, it's just even, even something as simple as that, there's often not that extra cash around that's going to allow you to be able to uh, take care of your family or your other family members if necessary. Another thing with the whole idea of wealth accumulation and the size of the wealth gap is presented here when you look at just how different it is even with more recent data uh, and looking at where we are around the wealth gap and that there is a significant amount of money that's very different for those in terms of the wealth gap that you can accumulate uh, or the wealth that you're able to accumulate. And there is, there is even studies that show that black college graduates have less wealth accumulation than a white high school dropout uh, in a recent study that came out about two or three years ago um, because there's been a lot of work done by the Ford Foundation over the last 10 years that has, in, had a, that has funded places like Demos um, as well as other places that I'm aware of, uh, Insight um, out of California, where they're looking at just how does this wealth gap affect people to be able to have a place or an anchor um, and their wealth is not being stripped away from them based on a variety of things we'll talk about in a few minutes in a way that's not being done to other people, uh, those being white primarily in this country. But for blacks and Latinos, they're seeing various wealth stripping um, mechanisms that are making it much more difficult for them to be able to get into a space. But what's really interesting when you look at a black college, grad black college graduate versus a white high school dropout, that's something very different from a historical perspective, but also from just a implicit bias perspective. What is going on there? Um, because you say to children, go to school, and no one would say, don't tell a child not to go to school, but there's something bigger going on when people are going to school and they're still not doing as well as their white counterparts. One of the biggest issues that we have to admit that's coming out right now that I've, I've been studying is this whole idea of what I would call debtor's prison. And what is it, what, how do fine and fees really affect people of color? And what are some of the available cash mechanisms in communities of color that are affecting them? One of the biggest issues that affect black people in particular or black brown people is this whole thing of payday lending. Um, but also, 
there's been these issues of fines and fees as it pertains to driver's license being uh, suspended. Or if you have a traffic ticket, um, there's a practice in Wisconsin where if you owe a traffic ticket and you don't pay, you will sit in jail and pay $50 a day to, to pay down your traffic ticket, which I just learned about three weeks ago um, through the work I've been doing. Um, so there's these ways that people are being fined municipal fees um, that's meant to fund the city um, in a way that is hurting poor people. Uh, and if you're under surveillance in some of these neighborhoods, as, as, as some of the researchers have said, particularly when they're being encouraged to accumulate debt, not encouraged to accumulate debt, but they're encouraged to accumulate fines as well as, as a way to help municipal debt, that's a bigger issue, um, which I, I'm now exploring, is what does that really mean? One of the most recent books that just came out three weeks ago, I have it up here right now, Not a Crime to be Poor by Peter Edelman, is a book that I would highly recommend for those who are not familiar with this whole idea of fines and fees. The fines and fees conversation came out very strong when Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and the whole issue with Ferguson, Missouri was that Ferguson was charged as a city to have 25%, 20 or 25% of its city revenue to be accumulated through the collection of traffic stops and other types of fines and fees that were that were um, collected through very impoverished folks or people who were at the poverty line in the city of Ferguson. And this had been going on for about 10 years. So it was a space where people were pretty much being somewhat un uncomfortable or angry with how they were be treated. But also it was focused on primarily black women and men. Um, and so this whole issue of Debtor's prison is very important to think about, but I would highly recommend the book by Peter Edelman for those of you who are interested in learning more about this. Again, Peter Edelman highlights that it's probably been primarily affecting those who are um, black and brown. Um, one thing about debtor's prison is that you jail a person who's unable to pay the to pay the violation of the uh, who by who to pay to violate the law. Um, but also, they're, they're sitting in jail until they can pay, which is generally a civil issue, not a criminal issue. Um, I just have a couple of things here to, to show you. One, Georgia deprives children as, as indigent parents, language in debtors prison for inability to pay child support is one thing that the Southern Center for Human Rights has been looking at, as well as the ACLU has been uh, doing a lot of swift action to end debtors prison in a variety of places from Ohio to Tennessee. Um, and it's happening in California. It's happening all over the country, in Wisconsin and, as well. One of the biggest issues that is affecting people's ability to have any wealth accumulation, but it is one way that most people have wealth, is through home ownership. One of the things that the government was very instrumental in that unfortunately has caused much of the non-wealth accumulation for particularly black people or for, uh, was, when it was started with the GI Bill in World War II. When soldiers returned home, there was a GI Bill that provided opportunities for those who were veterans to go to college and do other things. But primarily, one of the big things was that they could get a house, a mortgage. And for the first time, you get a 30-year mortgage. Um, that 30-year mortgage would be at a very low rate, and you could have a wonderful home. However, it was denied to black people because of the whole idea of it created redlining. Um, and because it was denied to black GIs who came back, that's when you saw the creation of the suburb and you saw the creation of wealth accumulation because before that time, many people did not own a home. They were not able to purchase it because of the, uh, I think it was you were required to have at least 50% for your down payment, whereas you know now it's much cheaper to get a down payment because that's the practice that we have. So the National Housing Act of 1934 had a clause in the federal government that said, if you have anyone in your community coming in there that's black, is going to bring down your property values. Um, and therefore, they decided to, if they provided any kind of loan, that they would have it, they would create, um, red was the worst place to be, green was the best, and blue was the in-between space. Um, so that's where redlining came from. Uh, and because so few black people to this day own a home, that's where this wealth accumulation really has its origin at. And a, a book that just came out this year, another one I highly recommend, that was up for a National Book Award was the one, the color, the color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America um, by Richard Rothstein, who came from the Economic Policy Institute. Um, it's it's, it's an easy read. My students are required to read it in a social work class because I think it's important to understand what are some of the issues that their, their clients may be facing. 
Um, but also, I would highly recommend that book as well if you if you're not familiar with what role the government played in in really not allowing wealth accumulation. What changed that, or what attempted to change that, was the Fair Housing Act of 1968. How it, it did a good job of making it a little simpler for people to be able to. Um, rent by a home. However, there are still issues with black and brown people not being able to um, get a home um, because of the historical practice of redlining and also people's fear of just what does it mean to have a person of color in their community. Um, so that's a historical issue. If you look at the home ownership rates, um, whites are 73 percent, blacks are 45 and Latinos are, lat uh, are 47 percent. Um, so with blacks having the least amount of home ownership, and this is from a report from Demos Institute for Assets and Social Policy uh, from 2015. Another issue, another big issue is employment, of course, and if you look at the unemployment rates currently, as a country we are doing phenomenal. These unemployment rates just came out last Friday. Um, overall, the unemployment rate is 4.1 percent. If you look at it by adult men, white men are 3.7. Blacks are 7.3, Asians are 3.0, and Hispanics are 4.7. Blacks are generally always double the rate of everyone else. However, these rates can be you know, somewhat misleading depending on the community you're in. And I'm, I'm going to share with you some numbers about Milwaukee specifically because that's where I do the majority of my research. And I'm always very interested in what does Milwaukee look like. And I have colleagues in Milwaukee at the Center for Economic Development who have done some really good work looking at a historical perspective of how Milwaukee looks. So if you look at Milwaukee from 1970 to 2010, um, everyone has gone down in terms of the number of the, 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 the employment rate for working age men from 16 to 64. But if you look at the far uh, left side, um, which maybe I think it's your left side, your left side, uh, you'll see that black men are definitely the lowest group here, on not, not, not half of what white men are, but they're about 40%, I would say, of where um, white men are in terms of their employment, and Hispanics are doing fairly better than um, blacks as well in terms of just employment rates from 1970 to 2010. Now, again, this is before this, these numbers are before the recession really hit strongly, so it's even a little worse than that now, but this is, again, giving you an idea of how it does look for blacks versus Hispanics. If you look at the number of Black, of males holding production jobs. Um, production jobs is the one way that blacks were able to really take care of their families because of the fact that they were coming straight out of high school. You can, have a, you can go into one of the factories that were located in the Milwaukee area or the metropolitan Milwaukee area and do quite well and have what you would think of as a middle class life. But since many of those companies um, started leaving in the 70s, you can see a significant difference um, and that many blacks now do not have those jobs. Uh, many whites do not hold them either, but it's because many of them are now either going to college or they have other jobs they're able to do, and they're able to be more mobile based on just whether or not uh, they're in, it would, based on where the community is they live in. Because um, in the surrounding areas of Milwaukee, there's a lot of production going on, um, but it's not areas where people who are black generally live. If you also look at the racial disparities, um, this is the same. This is the same one. No, I'm sorry, it's the same one. I have it twice. But if you look at it in terms of by age, in terms of how people are working, we tend to also see that the, the group that has the worst job experience are those who are young adults. Um, this, is a, his, this is not just a Milwaukee phenomenon. This is a phenomenon across the country that we have a very poor job market for those who are young black males and females. Um, we see that for the prime working age is where you, you're your most productive and you tend to set your career. Black blacks are still not doing it. Black males are still doing very poorly. Um, and then when you look across the board and you've seen this number already, is 44.7. Now, I know in the work that I do in the north side of Milwaukee, which is my primary area of, area of study or community of study, the, the unemployment rate is as high as 75% of those men are unemployed. Um, because of a variety of reasons we'll get into in a second. But when you have that much unemployment in a given community, it makes for a very, a very depressed uh, community, not, not necessarily uh, emotionally depressed, but there's not, very, there's not much going on in terms of stores and other um, things that would help for a vibrant, uh, successful community because of the lack of employment. Uh, unfortunately, we still focus on male employment in this country. Women are paged 80 cent to the dollar. Um, we tend to pay men more 
and all across the board, no matter what profession we had, they have, women still are not giving their due diligence and their um, intellectual capacity as well as their, their, their service. So we tend to still do that. So when you have a population of men who are not bringing in the community and women are the community that are bringing in the money, that's going to unfortunately lead to a depressed community. Um, and that's because we as a society don't value women's work. Um, but we do value men, and again, that's an important thing to, to conceptually to think about. If you look historically at what the numbers are around median household income by race, um, from 1967 to present, blacks have always held the lowest household income by race. Uh, and so this is not a new phenomenon that blacks have been paid, uh, and again, with, this, is, this is not distinctive for males and females, but for blacks as a, as a, as a group, um, they've always had the lowest in terms of income historically. Um, one of the suggestions by a, a colleague of mine out of the New School in New York, uh, Derek Hamilton, and as well as Sandy Darity in North Carolina, is that, you know, the country may need to consider a federal jobs program where people are guaranteed jobs because the one thing, a, a job is your personality. A job is who you are. A job makes for a healthy community. When people are working and everyone is in a bed, a job reduces depression. <laughs> uh, I think we can all agree that. And I think that because of that um, concern, that this whole idea of looking at going back to what we had in the 30s around guaranteeing someone a job for a period of time so they are able to get experience and able to take care of themselves and they have a livable wage will do wonders for our country. Again, it is, is a what we would call an innovative idea, but also it can be thought of as a very smart idea when it's looking at reducing some of the disparities that we see, as well as some of the issues that we see when people are unemployed. But again, I just thought it was important to show you that historically we've had these racial differences. This is not a new thing, and we've had them now for 50 years, um, as you look here. One of the men in my 1997 study, which I thought was interesting when I was looking at my preparation for this talk, said to me, you know, the whole thing is that there's a lot of jobs out there that are what we call temp jobs. And I'm, I've been looking at how temp jobs really have helped men, even from 1997 to now, so over 20 years. And the, the, the discussion is not very different. Uh, in, that, in this study that I did in 1997, uh, this man said this job might be long term. After 90 days, they're supposed to, you're supposed to be hired, but then the company can't can work you 89 days and say you don't need we don't need you. So then you you you're in this job, you get settled in it, think this is going to be it, and then boom, you are back on unemployment list waiting on another job. And that's something I have heard for 20 years from these men consistently, whether they're white, black, Latino. I don't generally see any Asian men in my studies, um, but for black men in particular, which just tends to be the main course of a main way of work for many of them in, in Milwaukee. Um, they're, they're, not, they're, being, they're not getting the opportunities they, they think they're going to get, and, but they still have bills. They still have other debts they have to pay. And I think it's important to understand, again, historically, we have to understand this is not new, um, but it is something that we need to start, start thinking about as a way to make it better for all of us. One of the ways, one of the reasons why we have many people do temp work is this whole issue of incarceration. And this chart, which I'm, I'm assuming some of you have seen before, is, is also from the sentencing project, shows how men and women look very differently according to the whole incarceration issue. For black men ages 20 to 34, one in nine of them will be in prison. And I know that in Milwaukee, I, I work in communities like 53206 zip code, where almost every man, there's not, it's like a one to two, one to two ratio. I mean, it's like 50% of the men, if not more of the men in that community have been incarcerated for some reason. Um, when you're in a community when that many men are under surveillance by the police or by child welfare or by child support or by someone else, it makes for a very unstable environment. It makes for a lot of stress. It makes for a lot of health issues. Um, there's research that shows that those who are incarcerated for one year lose three years of their life for every year that they're in jail. Um, so their mortality is already compromised. There's new research that shows even that some men who have lived in some of the homes in Milwaukee or anywhere in the country where there's lead paint and you've had an ingestion of lead paint over your lifetime as a child, there's more aggressive behavior. This research just came out of this year. Um, and I was informed of that research by uh, of, of the former health director of Milwaukee, where you have to really look at how does some of the things that people are exposed to in their earlier lives 
really does have some effect on where they are now. And because we're not, and if we have some implicit bias about a black boy being more aggressive or challenging, what is it about the home he was in? What about the community he was in that may have caused that, that we're not being responsive to as a society that might make that better? Of course, parents all have options. Parents all have responsibility to take care of their children, but sometimes discriminatory and oppressive practices don't allow for those real options or practice or opportunities that we would like all of our children to have. And one of the biggest issues that's destroying black communities, particularly black males, is this issue of incarceration um, because it is so much an issue right now based on what we're seeing and how mass incarceration has been a major issue. Lastly, I'm talk about health. You look at health life expectancy issues, you can see here by this chart historically, um, black men are definitely on the bottom. Um, they're not doing, they're, they're doing much better, um, but for, his, for quite some time, if we look at it from 1900s to now, black men have had a, a major um, issue around having good health care. And I want to highlight some of the areas that are highlighted here. One is life expectancy for black men is 74 years. I looked at Wisconsin's as I was preparing for this talk, and life expectancy for a white male is 80. Um, for a black male is 74. So um, being black, and, this, and Wisconsin has one of the worst health outcomes for black men in the country. <laughs> um, the only country, the only other states worse than here was Alabama, Mississippi, and I think it was Tennessee um, in terms of life expectancy as a black male. Um, one of the best states was uh, Massachusetts and New York City or New York. Um, some of the things that we've seen around death rate that really are related to black men is heart disease. Um, that's kind of related to blood pressure medication. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have access to health care. Um, the Affordable Care Act would allow some of these men to have access to health care, but if the state did not agree to take the expanded Medicaid um, coverage, then again, black women and black men who were single without children were not given that opportunity. There's three other areas where we, we, we've seen a decrease in HIV, AIDS, lung cancer, and homicides. Um, however, these are still the top four categories that increase or, 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 or contribute to the death rate of black men. Um, but we have seen a significant decrease in those three areas, not in, in heart disease somewhat, but definitely in the HIV, AIDS, cancer, prostate and colon cancer is still kind of up there. Lung cancer has gone down because there's less smokers. Um, and homicide has gone down a lot um, over the two decades, despite what we've heard with the most recent Black Lives Matter uh, discussion um, by uh, unarmed black men being killed. There still has been a, a, a large number of homicides that have gone down, despite what we may think is going on in those communities. Another thing that's really important, this whole idea is social determinants of health. Um, when you look at social determinants, we're on status and their health space, you know, education, we talked about it briefly already, and that education is definitely a factor that can make, make or break your life. I can attribute to that as a first generation graduate um, in my own family. Um, it made a significant difference to me um, and, and where I'm at right now and the opportunities I've had. But also place of residence makes a, is a big difference in terms of whether or not you truly have the opportunities that you need to have in order to be able to actualize in a way that's going to be good for you and your family. So that's two things that I want to highlight in terms of social economic status and, and bound around determinants of health. The other thing that's really a big deal, though, is this whole idea of the criminal justice system and what does it mean um, when you're interacting with the criminal justice system on a regular basis and you're under surveillance. Um, there's issues of stress, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there's issues of stress that are really important. Also, this whole idea of stable housing. Uh, employment and mental health is a big issue, um, but also whether or not you have any um, relations, any interaction with physical, sexual, or emotional illnesses, or um, if you've been in any way hurt in, 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 by any of those issues, either through the system or not in the system. And one of the things that I've tried to do by looking at social determinant health is to examine how health status affects your ability to work. Um, I, along with a colleague, Dr. J uh, Dimitri Topetsis at UW-Milwaukee in the social work department. We have been for the last couple of years looking at men and workforce, and we most recently joined our colleague, Dr. Mursky, um, to really look at over the next five years um, with community advocates, how if you, if you provide somebody with a transitional job or you provide them with a job, what are some of the things that will um, 
look what, what what can help how can it help how can it be helpful basically if you if you have access to a job you've access to mental health treatment if you have access to health care does it make a difference so Dimitri and I did a preliminary study um, where we looked at physical mental and behavioral health outcomes uh, and so I want to share with you some of those and hopefully take some of your questions after I go through this um, portion of the talk our demographics was 18 to 63 primarily African American small married group um, a good number of them, majority had children, uh, the majority had not completed the high school, and the majority of them had less than a 10,000 year income. In fact, the income was about more like $5,000 a year, the particular sample that we studied. Um, we, we looked at health status of African American men seeking services in Milwaukee, as well as we wanted to know more about this thing called adverse childhood experiences, because it really doesn't, it really was encompassing much of what I talked about earlier as to what are some of the issues that black men face when they're seeking jobs in Milwaukee in particular. What we found in our quantitative work was that, um, many of these men had a, a problem with their job history, even though they did have a job history. Um, but the majority of them had some kind of job history, but also the majority, a good half of them had an incarceration history. And there's a really well-known scholar, there's really good scholars at UW-Madison who are studying this interaction of employment with incarceration, which are, and one particular scholar uh, is finding that if you have any type of incarceration history and you're black, your chances of employment are pretty much zero for life. That's what he's starting to see now, um, because we have enough data to show and prove that if you look at over time as to what that means, that that's a big issue. And that can be incarceration from jail time to prison time. It's just having something on your record makes for a harder employment opportunity um, because we still have this moral judgment, if that's what you can call it. I don't know if that's what we would call it, but I'm going to just use the word moral judgment about someone who's been in prison or incarcerated does not deserve an opportunity, even though they may have served their time. And again, that could be somewhat race race place because we is this in, that, in another study done by a scholar who is now at Princeton but graduated from UW Milwaukee uh, maybe she's at Harvard now uh, Diva Pager Dr. Pager Dr. Pager did when she, her very her dissertation work was doing a study where you look and it's, it's out of the economics world where you um, have someone have the exact same backgrounds and in this particular study she did they had an incarceration background so she had white men apply for a job and black men apply for the job and they had the exact same background with an incarceration record, and every white man got hired, every black man did not get hired. And she's replicated the study in several other cities and had the exact same findings. So this is an interaction between employment, race, and, and uh, incarceration that is very clear um, that Dr. Pedro has been very good for, uh, um, for raising that information for us, as well as another professor, Dr. Lincoln Quallum, who used to be here and now is at a different school. I can't remember the location he's at, but those two scholars have been really pushing this issue of discrimination um, as it applies to employment background rather, rather clearly. What we found in our work at the Employee Milwaukee um, was looking at physical health, behavioral health, and mental health. And you can see when you look at the national data, um, our national, our national, our local data is quite high with some of the things that we're concerned about around determinants of health that can definitely affect whether or not someone's going to be able to live what we would call a fairly um, uh, safe and non-stressful life. One of the things that we found is that a majority of our men had a very high issue, a very high level of depression and anxiety. Um, and they weren't taking medication to take care of this, um, which can af affect your ability to be able to take care of yourself. So that's one thing that we, we highlighted. But also, the thing that was even more telling to us was looking at um, site one is the one we're going to concentrate on and the ACE study. And the ACE study is something that was done out of San Diego, which looked at a variety of attributes that attend to whether or not you will have any issues around your morbidity and mortality and your well-being. Um, looking at the issues of verbal, um, physical, and sexual abuse, you see that our men uh, tend to either be very much higher, like uh, verbal abuse was five times higher, physical abuse was almost double, not nearly double, maybe 30% higher, and sexual abuse was pretty high for our group. Um, and we had a very small sample of two, almost 200 men. For emotional and physical abuse, when you compare it to the national study of black men in the ACE study, um, we were at point one place three times higher, and another place, both places three times higher. When you look at batter, uh, household dysfunction of witnessing a battered mother, 
uh, household substance, mental illness, divorce or separation or incarceration. The incarceration one is 10 times higher. The separation and divorce is three times higher almost. Um, mental illness is almost not double, but it's, it's 25% or more higher. And household substance abuse is four times higher. The, the, what we're finding with when people have any, when people have four or more of these attributes attributed to them as children, their morbidity and mortality is, has been found to be compromised significantly, um, which is unfortunate. And so again, when you're looking at black men as a population um, who are coming from low income backgrounds in particular, it's, it's something we need to be attentive to in, in terms of you, you deal with all of these things as a child and then you have to deal with the issue of per, uh, police surveillance or being denied a job. Um, it makes for a person who's really just trying to be resilient as they can to make ends meet. Um, and so your economic security is going to be very much compromised if we don't attend to the issues that poor black men um, are facing on a regular basis. And this is the new, st the new study we're, we're looking at right now, Professors Mursky, Topestas, and myself, is to look at this uh, uh, preliminary data that we've gained and to look at it over five years. And I'm going to be doing a qualitative study of following about 12 men and learning everything I can about those 12 men and looking at their ACEs and what are some of the challenges they face around keeping a job um, and being able to live in a, on a daily on a day to day basis because I, no one's ever really ever done that and we think it's important to document what are some of the environmental, governmental, and community challenges they face on a regular basis and for, and family challenges they face on a regular basis. Um, if you look here, you can see that the majority of our site had four or more, where if you look at the national study, um, they only had 11% of their sample out of 4,000 people, and we had 200 people, and almost half of our sample had four or more. Again, four or more of these of an index score of ACEs definitely means you're going to die sooner, and you're going to have other morbidity issues or health issues much sooner than anyone else because of all the stress those expo that exposure has that you have been exposed to is going to cause. Um, the themes that we saw in our more recent study was issues of violence. Uh, a lot of these men talked about witnessing violence on a regular basis. I mean, witnessing violence to where you, someone's right in front of you, they get shot in the head, or you may witness a lot of people who are just dying around you, which can be violent as well. There's a lot of hopelessness that we saw. Um, work histories are compromised. Housing is a big issue for many of these men because many of these men cannot have a lease because of their prior incarceration experience, or they don't have children, um, or they don't have credit. And just an outside note around credit is that one thing that is even happening with employment is a lot of employers are not hiring people if their credit is bad. And unfortunately, people are not learned to, are not learning about credit if they're black because they never really have had credit, unfortunately, and their parents don't, don't know whether it's important to know about credit or how to how to handle their credit. Um, job insecurity is one of the things I heard a lot, as well as transportation or the lack of transportation in a big city like Milwaukee where you can't really go to a job outside of your community because there is no transportation to other local uh, suburbs that uh, allow you to get to those jobs. And there is transportation. It's transportation that takes about two hours. And I hear that often men will have four hours of their day on a bus getting to and from work, um, which is a regular phenomenon. And after a certain point, you can only do that so long. Lastly, uh, one man said, my rent is $500 a month, and you know, I know she needs to get money to survive as well, and she being the person he's living with. Um, so the person he's living with is a retired person. It's been a blessing. She's been like a mother to him. Um, but, you know, I feel bad because I haven't been able to man up. And I, I wanted to say that because a lot of these men, don't, when they define what does it mean to be masculine or to be in the role of a man, that's a big issue. Uh, I think that as a society, we have to really think about redefining what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to, to be masculine? Um, in a heteronormative society, there's, there's a lot of issues with uh, this whole idea of how do you be in a relationship when you are not being the breadwinner, when that is, this, that is really the, the foundation of what it means to be a man right now, but that may not be the way we need to go in the future. And unfortunately, I think some of the ways we think about manhood and masculinity as well as fatherhood is hurting everybody. And one thing I always say to my students as well as anybody else I talk to is that if we want our community to be better and prosper, we have to think about everybody. 
And that's the only way we as a society will ever be in a space that we all are going to be better off. Um, when we worry about, if we, if we worry about our tax, taxes, this is one place where you can definitely think about paying less taxes. If you think about the fact that if we all are better, I won't have as many taxes to pay because I won't need these programs. But I do think my colleague, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Darity, who's really pushing for this whole idea of a guaranteed jobs, uh, program, it's on to something um, because I think it's something that could really make a difference in many of these communities that I see in Milwaukee as well as, well as around the country um, that are struggling with opportunities for people who just may not know, they may, who may not have a social network, which oftentimes many of them are lacking. I thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, Dr. Pate. Um, that was quite a tour de force of the environmental uh, community um, and, and challenges that are posed, um, you know, even even by by, by government. Um, these are really dire challenges that the black uh, males face, like you said, on, on a daily basis. Um, and it's it's good to take the time to actually have this conversation and put the pieces together. I know there's much more to this, but we appreciate your your having um, taken us on this this journey for the last um, you know 50 minutes or so. We have a little bit of time left over for Q and A. I have a couple of questions here, um, and if you we've got six minutes, so we want to make sure that we honor people's time. So we'll go ahead and um, talk a little bit about, um, or actually um, pose these questions to you and, and see how far we can get. Um, so one of the questions that we received was whether your research attempted or attempts to highlight the political disenfranchisement um, that contributes to ongoing disparities between um, blacks, uh, people of color uh, more more broadly, and, and the historical white majority. That's a really good question. I only recently started to myself learn, understand the whole political process as well as how it affect this population. I have to say most of these men um, for the first time voted in the Obama election. Um, they, that was the first time they saw hope, as well as the first time that they felt that they could make a difference. But however, they don't see the government as really being invested in their life and making a difference. So it's a challenge. I think that in order for this to make a difference, or this whole idea of being political savvy, make a uh, to make a difference, the government has to do more to show that they really care about, about this population, and I don't think I, I don't think they see that. Um, sorry, I don't believe you heard the answer uh, for Dr. Pate. We, yeah, we were on we were on mute there, so um, I'm sorry. I will. I can answer, me to repeat the question. I, I okay, can, sorry about that. No, the question was about political involvement or disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement of uh, the men who I've talked to. The men who I've talked to have not really been politically involved because they really felt that um, the government has not really attended to their needs as well as to the challenges they face on a, def on a regular basis. And one of those things that I see often in, the, in, this, in, the, in, this pop, in this group is that they understand, sometimes I think they're um, they're the PhDs and I'm the person learning about the world because they really understand their day-to-day -day challenges. They just, but they also know that there's nothing out there for them and because we are at this point for good reasons very female focused on our services, it makes a lot of sense if you have children in your custody that you have programs that will attend to the needs of women and children. However, we don't acknowledge that there are poor men as well who have significant challenges in society. So often they hear we're going to make it better, but as you can see from my median income slide, for 50 years it hasn't gotten much better. It's gotten somewhat better. Um, income has increased a little bit, but for many of them it has not gotten better. And incarceration since the Clinton administration has made it really something they don't believe in anymore. So I think we have to really um, as Peter Edelman said at the talk I went to two weeks ago, that if the government wants people to vote who have been disenfranchised to vote, they have to show them that they care about what, who they are. Thank you, Dr. Pate. 
um, get a couple more. We've got a couple of minutes, but these are some really good questions. So let's let's see where we can go with this. Um, so uh, another participant asked, what are some of the organizations that have been or could be pivotal in redirecting the current path for black men? Um, there's several organizations, um, several people as well. Dr. Derek Hamilton, Dr. Sandy Darity are really, really good folks out of uh, the New School in, in North Carolina, uh, and, uh, and as well as Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Insight, Center for uh, Economic Development out of Oakland, California. Uh, the Center for Family Policy and Practice is the Center for Family Policy and Practice in Madison, Wisconsin, which does national work on men as well. Um, there's an Economic Policy Institute, um, which is based in D.C. The uh, who else? Um, those are the places that I work with on a regular basis. The Open Society Institute, um, the Ford Foundation has done some phenomenal work. The Kellogg Foundation is is, is uh, granting people to do some really great work as well, um, as well as the ACLU, the Brennan Center. Um, those are people who I talk to. The Southern Poverty Law Center. They're doing some phenomenal work looking at just how black men and black people, or black and brown people, are being treated. The people who are poor, I mean, also white people are included in that. But I tend to see, I tend to see them acknowledge that work as well as well as Georgetown's uh, Social Policy Center with Peter Edelman. They're they're doing some phenomenal work and and definitely should be recognized. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here from a family engagement coordinator for a K-12 school in the district. Um, she says, or yes, she says, I work with uh, families and students. What action steps would you suggest to begin empowering our African-American parents? Well, one, invite them to the table. It always helps a lot. Uh, acknowledge their presence, but also acknowledge their challenges. A lot of African-American parents um, don't have the privileges I have of being able to uh, be a professor who has who has some time to themselves um, to in, be involved in their children's schools, um, but also, and I, I know that teachers can sometimes get a little frustrated when parents don't come to a meeting. But also, unfortunately, a lot of black parents or a lot of parents who are poor often have challenges that are that come up that they just have no control over, um, or they they don't have the same they don't have the same resources that many people have in a place that allowed them to be as engaged in their children's lives as you would like them to. I think sending notes home, not assuming the parents are not engaged or don't care about their children. Um, and and if the, when I talked about earlier about education, one of the things the Yale study found was that once the teachers learned what they were doing, they were very open to changing it. They were very open to changing their behavior. And so I think it's important for teachers to have real conversations about how they're viewing their black and brown students. Um, and particularly black boys, because we tend to, we also unfortunately have this construct, social construction of maleness is aggressive. They're all aggressive. They all want to be mean. They all want to attack. They all want to do these things that are not good. Um, when we don't take a chance to really observe what part of this is my own stereotype I'm bringing to the table. So I would really want to thank you so much for your question. And I think you already are moving forward with the question in that you're trying to make a difference. But send notes home as often as you can to the parents, not just when you want to say something bad about the kid, but when you want to say something good. Oh, your kid had a great day today. Or I really applaud you for the, the fact that your kids are doing, your child is doing so well. I think parents never hear the good. They always hear the bad. Um, so that's what I would recommend right now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my apologies. Uh, we won't have time to get to all of the questions. Um, they're all very thoughtful. But um, to the degree we can, we'll, we'll see if we can um, shoot you some answers um, on the side there. Um, thank you all for your participation. Um, thank you, Dr. Pate, thank for you. a brilliant talk. Um, this recording will be available for playback um, from our website. We will be sending out the link in the next couple of days, so please be on the lookout for that. I want to thank, thank Bimo Harris again for making this learning opportunity available. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. And happy holidays to all of you.